Hello and welcome to the Company of the Cat, the channel where we talk about A Song of Ice and Fire and now House of the Dragon 2. Before the actual video, I want to say thank you very much to the people that watched my previous videos, especially the one about fire magic. I did not expect it to have the amount of views that it had. So thank you again to the actual video now. Today's episode is about House Hightower, a very interesting and very very old house. After House of the Dragon, we finally have a better picture of some members, because high towers are always in the story, somewhere in the background, always involved, but never in the spotlight. The dance is one of the very few instances where the members are not only involved, but in the center of the events. Otto in Fire and Blood is described as a hefty, blunt, domineering, methodical and ambitious person, but in House of the Dragon we saw more of him. He was also greedy, egotistical, self-seeking, a person that didn't have a problem exploiting his daughter for personal gain. Alicent is the way that she is because of Otto. One of the differences we have in the series is Alicent's age, and I think the reason was to point out even more how far Otto could go to achieve his goals, and how Alicent was molded from a very young age. Otto is also the reason for the difficult position his house was during and after the dance with dragons. Even without Viserys' last words to Alicent, Otto wanted his blood on the throne, and was planning a treason. Aegon wasn't a good fit for king, and Otto knew it, but that also means that he would be the real king in that situation. And this makes him very hypocritical too, because he didn't want Daemon in a high position because of his incompetence, which, yes, I agree. But now he is backing up Aegon like he's a good fit for a king. His son died, spoiler alert, I'm sorry, because he told him to check on the city watch. He was the one that promoted him in an organization that was loyal to Daemon, and the possibility of getting him killed was big. Members of his house fought and died, people of Old Town were attacked by other houses in the Ritz that kept their oath to Viserys and supported the Blacks. In general, one of the biggest reasons why the dance happened in the first place was Otto and his ambition. And that brings us to the house as a whole. Maybe we don't know many members as well as we know Otto and Alicent, but we have a lot of information about quite a lot of its members. And let me tell you, many of them sound as opportunistic and self-seeking as Otto. He wasn't the pioneer. Hightower since the dawn of time walked so Otto could run. So let's talk about some of them and the house in general. House Hightower is an ancient house dating to the Dawn Age, and many even believe they were even older than the first men. Their seat is the Hightower, the tallest construction in Westeros and the tallest tower in the known world. The house was also involved in the foundation of the citadel during the Dawn Age. High towers are ruling Old Town, the oldest and richest city in Westeros, and home to not only the citadel but also to the Starry Sept, the oldest sept in Old Town and one of the oldest in general in Westeros, and former seat of the High Septon of the Faith of the Seven. They're one of the richest and most influential houses in Westeros, and they have been for thousands of years. If history has taught me one thing, it is that you cannot become that powerful and stay that powerful for so long only with a pure heart, hard work and good intentions. Martin usually writes some characteristics for its house. It's not that every single member fits, but the majority does. For example, in Universe we see people say that Starks are loyal and have not broken an oath for thousands of years. Boltons very often are cruel, Ambers are boisterous, loud and crude, Baratheons are loud, easy to anger, but also like to laugh a lot. Lannisters are entitled and self-centered quite a lot, and so on. So it wouldn't be weird if some of Otto's traits as actually high tower traits in general. And looking at some members, I think this is the case since the founder. The house was always close to the crown and tried to have as much influence as possible, we see marriages between Targaryens and Hightowers, many members in the small council, etc. Something that isn't necessarily bad. There are times that this ambition though beat them in the ass, like during Maegor's reign for example and during the dance, but we will see that in general it was something that helped them climb to their position. First of all, the Hightowers are very close to both the Citadel and the Faith. Both of them are very big influence to lords and small folk alike, since every town has a sept and every castle has a maester. 
a maester from the Citadel which is funded and housed by the Hightowers. They have on their side both the church and the scholars, and many of the septons and maesters are related to the house, so they obviously are not 100% unbiased. During Aegon's conquest, Lord Manfred Hightower, head of the house, didn't join his liege lord King Mern Gardener. When news arrived in Old Town of the landing of Aegon, the High Septon fasted and prayed for seven days and nights under the dawn of the Starry Sept, and when he came out again, he said that the Faith would not oppose the Targaryens because the Crown showed the destruction of Old Town in Dragon Flames. When Aegon arrived at Old Town upon Balerion, Manfred opened his gates and welcomed him in. The High Septon then anointed uh, Aegon, King of the Seven Kingdoms, at the Starry Sept. And yes, I know, where is the harm in that? The Starks also surrendered because they wanted their asses to remain unburned. Yes, other houses also surrendered, but they didn't plan a welcoming ceremony for him along with a coronation, neither suggested a wedding, because our boy Manfred offered his youngest daughter's hand in marriage to Aegon, which Aegon declined because he had two wives they didn't want to offend. Something very similar happened during the Andal invasion too. Dorian Hightower, the head of the house at the time, welcomed the Andals and set aside his wife of 20 years and the mother of his children to take an Andal princess as wife. The next head after Dorian that we know about is his grandson Daemon. We don't know whose kid he was, but considering he was the first one to convert to the faith, I am guessing his parents were worshippers of the old gods. Damon, apparently, died young because of a bad stomach, whatever that is, and his newborn son and the next head of the house, Tristan, was raised and trained by Septon Robson. The Septon ruled for 20 years in all but name and became the first High Septon in Westeros. Lord Tristan raised the Starry Sept in Robson's honour after his passing and Tristan's son gave the High Septon the Crystal Crown. From this point on, Old Town and the High Towers started to have a close relationship with the Faith of the Seven. And obviously, the High Towers didn't stay in Old Town only, because who forbids them to be self seekers in other places too? Rancel High Tower, a member of the House and a former Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, tried to make the title of the Lord Commander hereditary and pass it to his son. The dude not only forgot his vows, he almost destroyed the Watch. And to even more serious matters, during the reigns of Aenys and Maegor the Cruel, we had the Faith Militant Uprising, a rebellion by the militant orders of the Faith of the Seven, against the rule of House Targaryen over the Seven Kingdoms. At the time, one of the queens of Maegor was Ceres Hightower, his first wife. Now, the Faith wanted the Targaryens removed, but Hightowers had a queen, one of many, yes, but still they had a high-ranking person inside the Red Keep. The High Septon called down the wrath of the gods on the Targaryens as the warrior sons of Old Town, led by Sir Morgan Hightower, surrounded the Starry Sept. However, when Targaryens, along with the dragons, arrived the next day in Old Town, they discovered that the High Septon had died the previous night and the city welcomed them in. The cause of High Septon's death remained debated, especially as he had been a very, very healthy man. One of the suspects is Sir Morgan Hightower at the command of Lord Martin Hightower, who was seen entering and leaving the High Septon's chambers the night of his death, and also was the only warrior's son ever pardoned by Maegor. Others point to Patrice Hightower, Lord Martin's aunt and the reputed witch, who had sought an audience with his High Holiness at dusk, though he was alive when she departed, so again they are not sure. Other suspects are the Archmaesters of the Citadel, the Citadel controlled by the High Towers, may I add, through the use of the Dark Arts, an assassin or a poisoned scroll, as messages were sent between the Citadel and the Sari Sept during the night of the Septon's demise. So all the suspects for a murder of the High Septon that wanted to remove the king, so in extension the Queen too, are High Towers or are connected to them. Now. Do you remember when I said that I understood why Manfred opened the gates to Aegon? Well, I still get it, even though he was way too slimy after that. But it was still a dick move to leave the gardeners hanging like that, because as a wise man named Jeremy Hightower once said, High Garden defends our back so we are free to gaze outward, 
to the sea and the lands beyond. Jeremy and his son Jason, with the backup and the support of the gardeners, fostered trade and built even more ships to protect it, doubling Old Town's wealth at the time. Jason also rebuilt a high tower a hundred feet taller. So, you know what? Gardeners maybe had their backs, but they sure didn't return the favor. So, let's go back to when the We Have Each Other's Backs happened. In the Age of Heroes, the Gardeners were at their peak, and all the rich minus Old Town was under the Gardener Kings. King Lymond Hightower had problems with the Ironborn at the time. They had the upper hand, but for how long can you keep going through constant ravings and still prosper, even when you can stand your ground? Not for very long. So Lymond and King Garland II came to an agreement. The gardeners would protect Old Town, allowing Lymond to turn his attention to his great purpose, the building of ships and conquest by sea, if the high towers made Old Town a part of the Kingdom of the Rich. Lymond agreed and did something revolutionary for a high tower. He put aside his wife and married Garland's daughter, and Garland did the same. He put his own wives aside to marry Lymond's daughter. So one can say that they are very relaxed with their oaths, agreements, and support. Now, before the OG dreamer, Uther of the High Tower, I want to talk about his sons Urigon and Peremor for a little bit, two members that we don't know if they did something like this, but they deserve a section since they are uh, credited for the founding of the Citadel. Peremor was the second son of the founder of House Hightower, King Uthor. He was not a very healthy child and this continued to his adult years, so his curiosity about the world outside and around him was big. Thus he turned to books, philosophers, teachers, priests, healers, singers, wizards, alchemists, sorcerers. In general, the crème de la crème of intellectuals. He had them all together and he loved seeing them disagree with mood. But sadly, Peremor died, so after Peremor's death, his brother Urigon told them to stay and gave them a part of land. There, the citadel was founded and these people established themselves and continued teaching, learning and questioning after the truth, and they still do to this day. So we're talking about an ancient institution, since Peremor and Urigon were the sons of the founder. High towers still are supporting the Citadel financially and many house members joined the ranks as maesters and some even as sorcerers, since we know from different sources that members of the house have an affinity for necromancy and not only. And now to the fun stuff. Let's talk about Uthor of the High Tower. Uthor was a legendary king and the founder of House High Tower. He is credited with commissioning the rebuilding of the high tower, turning it from a tall timber tower and a beacon to a structure of stone that rose 200 feet above the whispering sound. The next time we hear about him isn't in the Old Town chapters, but in the chapter about Garth's children. We are told that Uthor married Maris the Maid, a daughter of Garth Greenhand. Maris was the most beautiful woman in Westeros at the time, her beauty was so renowned that fifty lords vied for her hand in the first tourney held in Westeros. The victor was Argoth Stoneskin, but Maris went King Uthor of the High Tower instead, before Argoth could claim her. Argoth was so mad that spent the rest of his life outside Old Town's walls, roaring for his bride. And here we see not one, but two very popular stories from our world being hinted. The first one is the story of Helen of Troy, and the second one is the story of King Arthur's mother, Igraine. I am gonna say a big sorry in advance. I think I sound stupid when I say Greek names in English, so I'm gonna say them in Greek. So, in Greek mythology, suitors came from many kingdoms of Greece to compete for the hand of the Spartan princess, Eleni. The victor was Menelaus, but before the decision was made, uh, all the suitors should swear a most solemn oath to defend the chosen husband against whoever should quarrel with him. After the suitors had sworn not to retaliate, Menelaus was chosen to be Elenis' husband. As a sign of the importance of the pact, Elenis' father even sacrificed a horse. Eleni and Menelaus became rulers of Sparta, ruled for at least ten years, and they had at least one kid, a daughter named Hermione. After some years, Paris, a Trojan prince, came to Sparta to claim Eleni in the guise of a supposed diplomatic mission. 
Before this journey, Paris had been appointed by Zeus to judge the most beautiful goddess, Ira, Athena, or Aphrodite. In order to earn his favor, Aphrodite promised Paris the most beautiful woman in the world. And swayed by Aphrodite's offer, Paris chose her as the most beautiful. And this is where things become more complicated. We don't know exactly how Eleni left from Sparta. Ancient Greek sources are often incomplete and contradictory. Eleni is sometimes depicted as being raped and abducted by Paris. In others, she is tricked or bribed by Aphrodite to go with him, and in one she even went willingly. In Maris's case, I am gonna say she was tricked into marrying Uthor, and the reason is Igraine's story. In the Arthurian legend, we have a king named Uther. Uther is a very ambiguous figure throughout the literature, but is described as being a strong king. Igraine was the most beautiful woman in Britain at the time, and was married to Gorlois. Duke of Cornwall. After he succeeded his brother Ambrosius, Uther holded a feast for his nobles and when he saw Igraine, fell in love with her. Sensing Uther's interest, Igraine asked her husband to take her back home to Cornwall. This sudden departure gave Uther Pendragon an excuse to make war on Gorlois. Gorlois placed Igraine at the Tintagel castle while he prepared to defend his territory. Uther led siege to Gorlois castles to little effect, so he consulted his friend Ulfin, who told him that the lady can hardly look favorably on someone who make war on her husband, and suggested the king seek advice from Merlin in gaining access to Tintagel. Merlin devised an enchantment that disguised Uther in the form of Gorlois. Uther got into the castle and he managed to rape the grain by deceit, since he believed that she was laying with her husband. That night, she became pregnant with Arthur and her husband Gorlois died in battle. Leomon says Uther greeted Igraine, noblest of wives, and sent her token when they had spoken in bed. He commanded her that she should give up the castle quickly, there was no other way, for her lord was dead. Uther later made married Igraine, and Geoffrey said from the day on they lived together as equals, united by the great love for each other. But, from what we know about the story, Igraine most likely never learned about Uther's deception. With these stories in mind, I doubt our boy Uther married Maris because he was hot and honorable. He doesn't fit the high tower mindset of wars are bad for trade because this means war, so he had more to gain than lose. Both the Arthurian legend and the myth of the Trojan War symbolize the end of an era, in the first, we see the transition from pagan, nature-related gods to Christianity and the removal of magic. The second one marks the beginning of the end of the Age of Heroes. Isiodos wrote that the Trojan War was Zeus' plan to obliterate the race of men and the heroes in particular. Again, we see humans move away from magic and nature. The era where the Arthurian legend apparently takes place was full of wars. Saxons, along with Angles, Frisians, and Utes, migrated to the island of Great Britain. The Western Roman Empire was at its end, and Christianity was spreading, so there was a religious shift along with a geopolitical one. And something similar happened during the era where the Trojan War took place. The late Bronze Age collapse happened during that time, and it was sudden, it was violent, and culturally disruptive for many Bronze Age civilizations at the time and it brought a sharp economic decline to regional powers. Most common theories for the cause of the collapse include volcanic eruptions, drafts, diseases, invasion by the sea peoples and migration of the Dorians, economic disruption due to increased iron working and changes in military technology and methods that brought the decline of chariot warfare. And I believe we have the same thing in the novels too. We know of a huge catastrophic event at that point, the breaking of the Arm of Dorne. This event 100% caused some serious problems. Tsunamis, earthquakes, drastic sea level changes, change of oceanic currents and in extension change of the climate in many places around Planetos. Additionally, there is one more natural event that happened in all these three stories. A falling celestial body. Uther got the name Pendragon when he witnessed a dragon-shaped comet which inspired him to use dragons on his standards. Omiros, on the other hand, describes the same phenomenon with a variety of complex images as happening during the war between the Greeks and the Trojans. 
the comet appears as Athena coming from the west in the form of a shining star. This makes scientists believe that this phenomenon was actually the Phaethon asteroid, which at that point not only was it visible from Earth, but apparently interacted with it too, if the accounts of several cultures around the globe are to be believed. In the books, we also know about a celestial body at Dawn Age. Legend says that the first Dane was led to the impact site when he followed the track of a falling star, and there found a stone with magical power. But why am I telling you all this? Because I think that as in real life, in this universe, after all this shit, there was a huge geopolitical shift. If we look at the maps and take all the accounts into consideration, there are many places that are drowned now, but there were big civilizations flourishing there at Dawn Age. And I think Uthor took advantage of this mess. If we take a look, we see that the majority of the first men houses close to the sea are older than the ones on the inland. And they have a slightly different culture. We are told that all these houses were first men, but unlike the first men, they were great navigators and traders. There are enough differences that even some maesters consider the possibility that some of these houses, like the Ironborn and House Hightower, were not first men. And to be honest, looking at the names and imagery we get from all of these houses, I think they were indeed the same group of people that split after the breaking of the arm. All were seafarers, often paired with grey, green and fishy characteristics, and are close to the sea, also had similar ships, similar constructions and similar names. The names Uthor and Urigon are actually very peculiar names for first men. We don't see them very often. We see the name Uthor more, but the name Urigon is one that we see only in Ironborn characters, along with similar names like Uragon, Uras, Uron, Urathon. Another similarity we see is the fixation that both high towers and Ironborn had with the conquest by sea. Many high towers, like many Ironborn of old, had the reputation of being necromancers. Born a bastard on the Iron Islands, Maester Theron noted a certain likeness between the black stone of the base of the high tower and that of the sea stone chair, the seat of House Greyjoy, whose origins are also ancient and also mysterious. Additionally, the colors grey and green are often associated with both high towers and Ironborn. So here is what I think happened. People were already living in the western coastal areas and obviously they had a different culture than their inland neighbors. They were not farmers, they were seafarers, fishermen and traders. When the breaking happened, many places by the seaside drowned and a lot of people were displaced. We see that Old Town was inhabited even before the high towers, since there were constructions, big constructions there, and being so close to the sea level, I am guessing a part was drowned. Same with the arbor and the small islands around it. The Iron Islands were also not like they are today. Pike, another ancient castle with an unknown background, is half drowned. They have myths that after Grey King's death, the storm got drowned, his hole. I even think that Durand's castles before Storm's End that were crushed and blown by the sea were destroyed by tsunamis because of the breaking. The Lorathi that were destroyed by an enemy from the sea, too, I think it was just the sea. They were drowned. This is why there are mazes in both the Isles and mainland Essos. They were connected. Both the Thousand Islands and Northern Sothorios were home to huge donate civilizations, but now are half drowned and in a post-apocalyptic state. Unlike the sea people, the inland populations weren't that affected, so it makes sense for the people around them to seek their help. We know from the world book that Garth was giving to his children pieces of land as a dory. So Maris, being his daughter, his most beautiful daughter, I imagine had a good and big part, like Eleni, who was a princess and the heiress of Sparta, not just a beautiful face. The person that would marry her would also become a king. I imagine when people asked Garth about a place to stay, and in general people started flooding in, they had to find a solution. And a marriage is the perfect solution. We will have a competition, and whoever wins, he gets Maris along with her land. Fair and square. Sadly, the rest of you will have to find another place to accommodate you. We know that Argoth won, but Maris married Uthor instead, and Argoth was outside Old Town roaring until he died. 
Argoth and the rest of his people, like Menelaus and the rest of the Greeks, were pissed and tried to take Maris back, but also the lands. Because from Uther's story, we see that Pendragon took both Ygraine and Gorlois castle and land. The isle where the high tower is built is called Battle Isle, but we don't know what battle happened there. I would say that the battle was Argoth, who sounds ultra ironborn, by the way, and his people versus Uther and his people, who tricked them, and the reason we don't have written scrolls is that the citadel was formed after by the high towers. I doubt they would let the maesters write them as honorable cheaters. After Argoth's death, the Ironborn went back to Iron Islands and made pillaging and piracy their main source of income. Because in the Iron Islands, it's not that you have many choices. Like the real-life Northmen, the geography, geology and topography of the land pushes this kind of culture. And that would explain why the Ironborn have such a disdain for trees and people from the reeds. First of all, if the breaking happened indeed magically by the children and the trees, they would obviously dislike them, because they got in this whole mess because of them. And secondly... When they were wronged, the majority of people from the Reeds didn't get involved and let Uthor get away with it. I say majority because there is one house that I think tried to help and support them. House Goodbrother. Unlike the rest of the houses from the Iron Islands, they have a different background. They are not descendants of the Grey King, they are not as close to the sea as the rest of them, they have some traits like fertility that are traits connected to Garth, so I guess they were a house originally from the Reeds. When the shit hit the fan, they were like, look guys, this is not okay, we had an agreement, what the fuck? And they sided with Argoth, and after his death, they went to the Iron Islands along with the rest of those who would become the Ironborn. So yeah, this is pretty much it. Looking at the stories that inspired the specific event, the stories of other high towers as well, I would say that yes, Uther was the original self-seeking high tower, and high towers in general are probably some of the biggest opportunities we have seen in the series. This is it for this week's video. If you stuck till the end, thank you very, very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, press like, comment, subscribe to the channel, and tune in for the next one, which is going to be about the Ironborn and Dalton Greyjoy that we will see in the next season of House of the Dragon, I hope. So yeah, bye!